Good evening and welcome everybody to Eureka Stories, The Power of Putting Science Center Stage. My name is Aaron Mertz and I'm the founding director of the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program, which was established in 2019 with the mission to raise public trust in science and to help foster a more diverse and a more societally engaged scientific workforce. I'm thrilled to present this event today with two wonderful collaborating theaters. Um, I'm going to have my wonderful colleagues, Jasmine and Nikisa, talk about their work. Great. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, my name is Jasmine Jang. I am the PR and Partnerships Manager at Roundhouse Theatre in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, Roundhouse is a theatre for everyone. We are dedicated to enriching our community through bold, outstanding theatrical and educational experiences that inspire empathy and demand conversation. So in a lot of ways, The Catastrophist is kind of the perfect show for us, and we are honored and thrilled to have co-produced it uh, with our good friends at Marin Theatre Company. Uh, this is a time where it has been especially important to, to build public trust and interest in the sciences and to really celebrate and humanize the work of scientists. So uh, what a wonderful opportunity to work with Marin, to work with Lauren, and to work with the Aspen Institute Science and Society uh, to, to put together this great panel of uh, artists and storytellers and communicators and other people who, like us, understand that there is power in art uh, and some of that power can be used uh, to highlight the work of beautiful scientists. With that, I'm going to pass it off to Nikisa. <laughs> Thank you, Jasmine. That was so inspiring. My name is Nikisa Edamod. I'm the Associate Artistic Director of Marin Theatre Company. We're located in Mill Valley, California, in Northern California. Um, on behalf of Marin Theater Company, we want to thank you for coming to tonight's event and spending this time to delight in the light bulb moments of science and the creative spark that creates some wonderful things inspired by science and science related in all the various mediums. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Marin Theater Company. We're the American Playwrights Home for the Development, Production, and Promotion of new plays that tell the story vital to our times. We seek to initiate an ever-expanding engagement between theater artists and our community through challenging plays and quality educational programs that aim to inspire, educate, and encourage empathy. We are so excited to be partnering with Aspen Institute Science and Society and uh, Roundhouse Theater. And we, uh, especially on the filming of Lauren's extraordinary script, we hope you've all seen The Catastrophist by Lauren Gunderson. If you have not, make sure you visit our website. At, uh, you can purchase tickets at either marintheater.org or roundhousetheater.org. And now let's get to the good stuff, <laughs> the science talk. Exactly. Thank you both. Um, I want to mention briefly the impetus for this event, which is the second in a two-part series about science and storytelling. Um, the Science and Society program is guided by an advisory council of 20 people who are approaching science from myriad angles. And one of them, I'm very proud to have recruited to that group, Lauren Gunderson. Um, she's a playwright, screenwriter, and short story author. And she's Marin Theater Company's playwright in residence. She was named the most produced playwright in America by American Theater Magazine in 2017 and 2019. And she finds deep and thrilling drama in the course of scientific progress and stages it as much as possible. She reached out to me after writing and producing with Marin Theater and Roundhouse um, this play called The Catastrophist about how we could promote it uh, through the Aspen Institute and the theaters. And we came up with this two part series to have live discussion about the power of telling scientific stories. The previous event featured scientists who talked about the stories that got them into science research. And tonight we're gonna to flip it around and have writers who talk about the science that they put into the stories that they tell. So let's bring Lauren on, who's gonna say some general remarks and then we'll bring on, then I'll talk about the format after that. Hi everybody, so great to have everyone here. Thanks for all of you out there and all of the ways that you're you're watching. Um, the short story is that when I knew I wanted to be a playwright uh, at a pretty young age in middle school, early high school, 
I knew uh, that I wanted to write, but I didn't know what I wanted to write about until I found the stories of science. I had a great physics teacher and a biology, biology teacher. Thank you, Joe Wintersheet. Um, and he helped me see the incredible drama at the heart of Eureka moments, uh, the triumphant ones, the failures, the adventure of science. Um, and it has been part of my lifelong uh, pursuit of the kind of truth that you find in art and in science. And that's where I find the connection here. Um, and so the opportunity to talk to the folks you're going to see tonight is just extraordinarily exciting. Um, we're gonna talk uh, with folks who are in the world of musical theater, music, journalism, uh, theater, of course. Uh, and it's it'll just be a chance for us to kind of try to get to the heart of what is uh, the storytelling of science that matters, that um, illuminates and elevates and unites. And I think that is our work at its best. So I welcome you and I'm I'm really honored and thrilled to be joined by everybody. Thank you, Lauren. The format for tonight will be rotating paired conversations. So we'll have two people on at a time in conversation about their work. Um, so the, and then after we go through our five pairings, we will have a Q and A based on the questions we receive in the live chat. So please throughout the event, um, ask your questions, offer your comments. We'll be monitoring those and we will be delivering those to the panelists at the end in our Q and A session. So joining Lauren in our first conversation will be Brie Laudermilk, who is a queer, trans, gender non-conforming musical theater writer, a YouTube creator, songwriter, and dramatist. Off-Broadway work includes The Mad Ones and Henry and the Mudge, which toured the country for over a decade, both with longtime collaborator Kate Kerrigan, who will be joining us later. Upcoming projects include the immersive house party, The Bad Years, Republic, with Michael Arden, Kill the Boy Band with G. Hay Park, and Enclave with Liliana Padilla. Other musicals include Flash of Time, an immersive art puppet installation, and musical hybrid at the Kimmel Center in Philadelphia, The Amazing Adventures of Dr. Wonderful and Her Dog, and Earthrise at the Kennedy Center in DC, and Rosie Revere, Engineer and Friends, written with Lauren Gunderson, which is currently touring the US. So let's bring on Brie for our first conversation with Lauren. Well, it's not touring this year, is it, Lauren? <laughs> not touring this year, but soon we'll be back in the room. Hi. Oh, Hello. I adore you so much. Thank you Hi, for coming. Um, so the short version is that Brie and I met because I was in desperate need of a composer and lyricist for this crazy idea. I had um, a commission for the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, that uh, I had dreamed up this musical having never written really one <laughs> before <laughs> called The Amazing Adventures of Dr. Wonderful and Her Dog uh, about a young girl who uses science to solve mysteries with her dog. Um, and I just had the most fun and learned so much about musical theater. And I think we both had to Google and Wikipedia lots of science facts as we created this solar system hopping um, show. So when I first came to you with this idea, what? How did you approach it? How, what, what was what was that like for you? Well, the thing that I fell in love with in musicals was the idea that it's it must be a hybrid art form, and that you that there's something about it that requires you to like meet someone else's mind and find this space in between. And so um, I tried to, you know, based on years of collaborating with other folks, notably Kate, who you'll meet in a bit, I tried to, you know, trust you and trust that you had this voice that was going to be bringing something to musicals that was going to be rare and surprising and exciting specifically because you had not made one yet. And that there was like a gentleness I wanted to come to you with of let me not, let me add, let me, let me amplify what Lauren does and not trample. Let me not like extinguish any of the brightness that Lauren's bringing. Let me not do the thing of, oh, you can't do that in a musical. Oh, you cannot bring that in here. But to just say very gently and with a lot of grace, like, great, welcome, we'll make it work. 
Yeah, I love that. Um, and so we've collaborated on three and a half and half a dozen more <laughs> new ideas coming. Three and seven eighths. <laughs> three and seven eighths musical projects at this point. Um, and you know, one thing that I love about your um, just your your history as as a musician and a composer is your other degree that you maybe almost sort of got, <laughs> which I which I confirmed moments ago to make sure I wasn't I, I didn't misremember this. So what was your original trajectory? I know you landed in yeah. reason music. What was some of your perhaps relevant stop offs? <laughs> so I went to I went to Harvard ostensibly for math and then and then left. Um, I've never told you this story, Warren, but I um, the, the the like first week that I was at Harvard in a dorm um, that was on Prescott Street, but whose name escapes me, um, a girl came and like knocked on the door. And this was like just after Legally Blonde had come out and she was wearing all pink and she was from Mississippi and she had this accent and she had made cupcakes and was like, and I was like, what is this human? And then like fast forward to like a few days later as I got to know her and discovered that she was something like 12 semesters ahead of me in math. Um, and like, it was like, you know, pretty much impossible <laughs> for me to like get where she was. Yeah, I was, I was good at math in high school. Um, and then I don't know, there was something that just was not clicking as I, as I got there, something that like was not where my brain wanted to be. I wanted to be over with the theater kids. I wanted to be with the music kids. I wanted to be getting messier, I think, than maybe it was going to be possible. I mean, messy math kind of sounds like musical theater to me. I mean, how, what's your relationship? Um, I, of course, jump to, well, math and music share a lot in, in common in terms of certain philosophies and foundations. Um, do you think when you write music, do you think mathematically? Uh, do you think, how do you jump from the kind of storytelling aspect that um, a song needs to lift us so it needs to make us cry it needs to make us pause and think it needs to break in the middle and have a big idea I mean how do you do that drama work with the kind of technical part of of writing music that's really it, for me the real challenge is not imposing form too early and truly to go back to the first time I read a Lauren Gunderson script with the intent to musicalize it it was really hard for me not to go like this is where the act break needs to be. This is where we need our protagonist to sing. This is where we need these things to happen. There's no I want song. Like these threads aren't coming together. Like it was really hard not to do that and to instead say, let the form expose itself organically. You know, it's, I, I think because I do have an innate sense of structure, I wouldn't say that I have any kind of innate gifts when it comes to music or text or that, that doesn't feel like where my gifts are. I, have a, I, I do have a sense of structure. I'm always like aware of where I am in something and especially in music and especially mm -hmm. in drama, I'm just aware of bookmarks and I know where I want to be and where I should be. Um, but it's, it's really, really hard to like be present in a story, like either witnessing it or on the page and to say, let it coax out, like do not like force yourself into this like protagonist driven quest narrative or this, you know, very, very masculine essential like story formula that we expect to see, like let, let something weirder happen, let something more surprising evolve. Do you, I mean, it sounds to me like there's a lot of experimentalism in how you make plays. I would say the plays we've made together, there is a lot of that. Um, and I, I feel like in some ways, even the process of theater m matches stories of science because we need to have those eureka moments within the, the actual plot, but there's a lot of eureka moments in the making of it. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't know if this resonates with you at all, but I feel like there's like a little bit of like an independent study selfishness that in, informs a lot of the work I choose to do where it's like, who will I get to be in a room with? And like, what will I get to learn? And what is the potential exposure I'll have to that like professor I really wanna work with? Or to be able to have that excuse to be in dialogue with someone and ask the questions you wanna ask. I mean, 
just to throw the question back on you, like you've written real life stories of Marie Curie and like, you know, you've, you've wrestled with like texts of Whitman and, and so many people that like force you into conversation with either with source material or with experts in a certain way. Is any of that like driven by a personal desire to get to sort of design your own course as mm -hmm. like we continue to grow? As oh my God. Yeah. yeah. That's such a great way to say it. Yes. I want to follow the curiosity of, you know, I think once the, the, the pieces are confirmed, like, oh, I think this could actually be a great story because the character is rich and they want something and they go through something big, then it is the fun of going, oh my gosh, I get to learn about the solar system or radioactivity or <laughs> Newtonian um, mechanics <laughs> or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think about the stories that we've told um, together, uh, which all have, mo most have been science related. Um, and I think of the last project we did uh, for the Kennedy Center was a play called, a musical called Earthrise about the moon landing and the children of the folks who got us to the moon. Um, and I just, I will always remember the first time you shared with me the theme song or the, the, the title mm -hmm. song of Earthrise and how it felt transportative. This is a song mm -hmm. where our characters go to the moon and how on earth do you do that? <laughs> in a song, how did you, how do you think of, this? I mean, just, just perhaps using that example, how did you make that um, song in particular? I think that I'm always aware of like levels of reality and like, and you know, music comes back to theme and repetition always, just that simple like state it, maybe go somewhere for a second and repeat it, state it and repeat it. And so I'm always looking for what are the extremes? Like, what am I going to state? Where am I gonna go? Where am I gonna come back? And am I going to come back to the thing that I, that was the B material before? Like, what are the building blocks? And um, yeah, and trying to keep track of like what I can put in relief. Like, how can I take this like really, really hard to get at science idea that's so beautiful um, and that I understand, but it took me, you know, a day or two to do so. Like, what can I put in relief to that that can help make that feel like it makes emotional sense yeah. and not just literal sense? Do you feel like you're like tracking multiple realities in your writing some or multiple audiences where you're like trying to make sure you're serving people different kinds of audience members? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And especially for theater for young audiences because you're not just talking to the kiddos, you're talking yeah. to their parents, their grandparents, and if there can be a conversation built with all of those generations, that's good work. Whereas if it's just the kids who think it's funny or just the kids. But I will say one of my my <laughs> shining achievements was in our Dr. Wonderful um uh, Brie wrote this incredible song called Solar Fusion, which was about, yes, solar fusion. <laughs> and we got an entire audience of fourth graders, I believe, chanting solar fusion. <laughs> so very bare minimum, they now know that that word exists, that phrase exists, and perhaps maybe know a little bit about what it means, which, you know, that's a good day's work. <laughs> and and they sang it. <laughs> um, I mean, I I think there are... I, I wonder about the language of science because you write music, um, but you also write lyrics sometimes or certainly collaborate. Uh, and I, I'm just thought of the email you, you sent me just yesterday. We are working on kind of like a sneaky project. Um, and the, e the title of the email was second verse, more science. <laughs> um, so what, what of the language of, of science, because it is so unique, but also has such metaphor to it sometimes, the way that words, you know, can, can mean a lot of things very specific to a field, but also kind of almost poetically. Do you, do you like that? Do you like the words of science? Or is that like, oh gosh, I have to figure out how to squeeze, you know, tectonic plates into this <laughs> song? Especially now, um, I, feel, um, I feel very held by scientific fact and language. I feel very held by precision. I feel very scared broadly in the world of like casual use of terms that don't mean a precise thing. I feel like a desire to be very, very strict and precise about language. Language is deeply important to me and so much about like 
gender and identity and how I present in the world um, feels like it's very about very nuanced, precise usage of language and this agreement of whether or not you and I agree on the meaning of these words. And there's something um, in scientific and mathematical reasoning where it comes down to like a shared language that goes beyond borders and goes beyond time and is something that we can look at. But it's like that, it's that freaking equal sign where you look at and you go, this is truth. And we can all agree that this is truth. And especially like with some of, you know, the things that are happening with how information is disseminated these days, I, um, I take great comfort in those rare times that we can all agree on um, what an equation adds up to. Mm. So, all right, the Fauci musical. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's our what's our I want song? I just pictured Fauci on the balcony. Don't cry for me, you know. <laughs> or like, yeah, or please cry for me. Oh my god. <laughs> there it does seem like I think there's probably a musical in like Fauci and Gates. Like the way that like like Bill Gates like now like talks about like how like that bromance like really like predated Fauci being someone everyone knew. Like, I don't know, Bill Gates is like talking about Fauci, like, you know, this person he used to know, but now he doesn't really return his call. Like, I don't know. There's something about like Gates and Fauci that I feel like could be like an Alpha and Galinda kind of thing. I mean, I am here for it any <laughs> any day of the week. <laughs> There will definitely be some of those musicals to come and and they will they will need your help mm -hmm. <laughs> as I have. Thank you for this wonderful interview. Um, I will deck out and look forward to the rest of the interviews and see you at the end of the cycle. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Now we're going to bring on Kate Kerrigan, who is a Claben Award winning book writer, lyricist, and playwright. Off Broadway work includes The Mad Ones. Henry and Mudge, and she has written books and lyrics for The Bad Years, Republic, and lyrics for Rosie Revere, Engineer and Friends, and Earthrise with Lauren Gunderson. Her plays include Father Daughter, Disaster Relief, Imaginary Love, and Transit. Hi, Kate. Hi, Bri. <laughs> Kate and I have known each other for quite some time. We've been writing with each other for quite some time as well. Yeah. But something I don't actually know about you, Kate, is whether or not you had any affinity for math or science in, in high school. That's interesting. I thought you were gonna, you were going to say that you'd never interviewed me before, that that was the, that that was the new thing. And it, it is the new thing. That's also a new thing, but I'm excited. <laughs> I get to ask um, you whatever I wanna know. Yeah, I, I had a, mo <laughs> science was actually a little bit my Achilles heel. I hmm. thought, I, I, I until um, until I was about a junior. No, I was a senior. I was a senior in high school when I took um, I was taking uh, AP chemistry and I loved chemistry. Actually, I loved normal chemistry and I hit um, I hit organic chemistry that for whatever reason, the teacher decided to start with orgo, which you don't normally do. And it was not fair. It was not nice, but I, I hit it and I just hit a brick wall and I'd never had that happen to me as, as a student before I'd always been able to work through it and get to the other side and make it happen. And that was the first time I was like, Oh, I I'm not a scientist. That's great to know. <laughs> Let me go double down on the the arts and on language, which I'm doing better and better and better with. And um, and I loved history and I loved all of these other things. But I suddenly was like, oh, this is and, and at the same time, I was doing physics, which I realized that as much as I was actually quite good at math, as soon as it became real, I became not good at it. I was great with the theory and I was a disaster when it came to um, applied mathematics. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. I think that's interesting because, I mean, in, in especially like I think about in your playwriting, like the mm -hmm. extent to which like you've specifically in Imaginary Love, in Transit, in, um, in, in so much of your work, like you've created situations where you have like these big research components to the pieces you're doing and like where you're engaging with these ideas that are like in some ways, like very far away from 
like what your like home is what do you think that what do you think it is that like drives you to make pieces that are like farther from the ideas that are deeply comfortable to you i I, well, I love I love pop science. Like I love reading a science book that was written for me, um, like a, like a Brian Green <laughs> Cosmos book. Like anything that was written for the, anything that you can get in an airport that's about science, I love. Um, and the same thing's true for mathematics. The same thing's true for history. Like my I'm I'm an expert in my field and I'm an expert in literature. Um, and I'm not always happy with the airport options with literature, but I love an airport book, airport book store for all of these other subjects. And I'm a like total generalist when it comes to that stuff. So I think that there's a little bit of me that likes to go far afield. I, I like metaphor too. And that finding, finding a really precise metaphor to describe something that feels deeply true to me. Um, you sometimes you have to go pretty far to find them, um, to really find exactly what you're talking about, that that really specific language that makes another person who is not you say, oh yes, I understand what that is. Yes, that's, that's the feeling that I've always had, but I've never had a name for. Do you think it's possible for songs to do what like pop science books can do in terms of that like communication and that handoff? Yeah, definitely. But it's about feelings, right? <laughs> Isn't that what a song does? Like, and I mean, I guess we do it when we're trying to write, when we're trying to make a Lauren Gunderson musical yeah, for sure. science-y. Um, when we do that, I definitely am trying to create a situation where the science of it is accessible enough that you feel smart as you listen to it and you feel like you got it you understand what that rocket's doing you understand because i didn't understand before i started working on the project either so i'm a i'm a great lay person to try to explain to you now that i sort of understand how a rocket goes into space i can give you the basics i can't give you much more than the basics but i can actually tell you like what parts of the rocket are falling off in order to send it out into space and i'm going to put that into a lyric to try to help you um but i think that also like emotionally that's what we're always trying to do right we're always trying to create a space in musicals where you can talk about something that you normally can't talk about and that you don't have words for because words alone are not enough. Mm. Um, and so I think in musicals, if they're about science, um, the music sort of makes it more palatable, more possible for someone who doesn't understand science as well to feel like they understood it. And um, in, in general, like that naming of a feeling and then having somebody else say, oh yes, that's exactly what it feels like is, is the thing that I think I'm always reaching for. I love that idea that because you, because these ideas were new to you in the piece or like the deep understanding of them was new to you, that makes you like a really valuable translator of those ideas into a different medium. Translation is exactly what I was. I, that's the word that came to my mind as as you were talking. Yeah, that I that, that you're you're not. I'm not a native speaker, um, mm. but I can I can I can speak well enough, and I can join in well enough, and I'm good enough at what I do. I'm good enough at being a translator that I can bring you with me, in spite of the fact that you don't speak that language at all. Okay, well, let's get into it. I mean, I feel like there are, aren't, isn't there like a whole thing where people like get really snarky about pop science? Like, and get oh, a yeah. little, like, cause people get really snarky about like, so. about, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm a little embarrassed about how much I enjoy pop science. I feel like I should like real science, but I don't, I really like pop science. But <laughs> like here's science the thing, articles. <laughs> hey, a non-negligible percentage of our country doesn't believe in science. I know. It would be great if they if more people liked pop science. Yeah. I would be into that. <laughs> May it be a gateway into other science. I, I mean, it is for me. That's how it starts. I read science articles and then I'll be at the, I'll be at the airport and I'll find a book that's about something that I've read a, an article about. And I was like, oh, that article was great. I was really interested in that. And then I will read an entire book about the cosmos. 
And it doesn't give me any of the physics that blew my mind, or it gives me like a small enough amount that I can kind of skip over it. And then, and, and then I keep going and I get to get all of the, like the high of the beauty of the science, as opposed to the, the math of the science, which is hard. Yeah. I feel the same way about math. Um, I briefly dated someone, you remember this, I briefly dated this guy who was, um, who was a mathematician and it took me a while to realize that he was not interested in anything besides math because he would talk to me about math and I loved it because he didn't use any numbers to talk about it. He just talked to me about these theories and they were beautiful and they were incredible metaphors for things in real life. I mean, math is real life. Math is real life. Perfect. A great, <laughs> a great lyric if ever I've heard one. And, <laughs> I mean, for anyone out there who's not like innately like knowledgeable about like how a musical is made, when we're talking about book music and lyrics, we're talking about these subsections of like how three brains come together oftentimes to create one larger whole. What can often happen, and what certainly happens in like the Lauren Kate and Brie collaboration, is that folks kind of recognize what like specialty and what like what like camp they need to hang out in and conflict within that team can actually be like a really really valuable thing right when someone is advocating for what songs need to do and someone is advocating for what scenes need to do um and i guess my question for you kate is as a lyricist on those pieces with lauren and i when lauren's coming in having written a script oftentimes and like also being a bridge possibly to a dramaturg and to like science advisors. And when I'm coming in like with big, like emotional ideas connected to music and tone, how do you thread those two worlds and how do you act as someone in between that? And like truly a translator, not just of the science, but of these two, um, these two genres and two forms. I mean, I think that's, I love collaborating. I love it. Um, I love having two things that don't seem possible at the same time and then finding that space in between and finding the way to make the two things both happen and generally like looking for the the third solution, the third way that um, that that thing that that can make the musical idea that has to happen, that will make it beautiful, that will make us cry that will make a sore happen while also serving the story and the science and making sure it's like it's really really ironclad um and and trying to figure out those moments when you actually have to let go of the um when you have to let go of the thing that is factual um, versus the thing that is emotional. And when you have to let go of the thing that's emotional for the thing that's factual, like that net navigation um, is, I, I don't know, it's really, it's really thrilling to be in the midst of that and to be in conversation and trying to understand what everyone needs and not lose your own agenda, um, but like really meld all of it and really listen. It's, it's about, I mean, it's a it's a it's a listening game. Um, you're really trying to hear not just the thing that the person is telling you that they're saying, "I need this deeply," um, but also all of the other things that they're not necessarily saying they need, or all the things that they may actually need, and maybe they don't need that exact thing, but they need something underneath it. Um, and then trying to navigate those things and make make everybody happy because the thing that I love about theater is that it's hybrid um, and that it's best when everybody, when it's a big tent and everybody is moved by it. Um, it's not, it's never a single singular vision ever. And so it shouldn't be, it has to be bigger than what you could imagine yourself. Um, and I guess that's something that's very connected to what I find moving about science. Um, that idea that you're making something that's so big and much bigger than a musical, but you're making something so big that you might only see a small portion of it. You mm -hmm. might only be able to take it this far, um, but that over time, over a generation, um, you end up making a Corona vaccine that you didn't know that you were making. Um, like that, that's so beautiful. Um, and I think that that's sort of the thing about musicals on a smaller level. Um, and it, it, it gets a slightly and potentially more satisfying level in the short term. Um, but uh, but it is that is that sense of okay well but 
let's all bring it together. And, you know, we worked on the show Earthrise at the Kennedy Center. And it was such a beautiful experience because there were so many artists who were um, so engaged and so excited because we were celebrating the, the, we were celebrating the moon landing. We all came at it from this, this really, um, this spirit of, of discovery and thinking about each one of those people um, as artists bringing what they were bringing to the table. All of us were in this very, this room that wasn't even supposed to be a theater and watching all of these different artists make things and trying to use what everybody's special skill is, um, the thing that they have that's beautiful, that's most exciting. Um, yeah. That's beautiful. Kate, I love writing with you. I love making science with things with you. It's the best. <laughs> One day, friend, we'll be there in that airport together again. It'll be great. I can't Browsing wait. Science. We'll buy so many science books. Oh my God, so many science books. <laughs> Um, I think uh, now I go away and Kate's going to interview a scientist. Good luck with that, Kate. <laughs> Thank you, Bree. Um, Kate, now you're going to interview um, our journalist for this evening. Yes. I'm thrilled to introduce <laughs> Joe Palka, who, in addition to Lauren, is a member of the Aspen Institute Science and Society Advisory Council. He is a correspondent of the Science Desk at National Public Radio. Since joining NPR in 1992, he has covered a range of science topics, everything from biomedical research to astronomy. He is currently focused on his series, Joe's Big Idea. Stories in this series explore the minds and motivations of scientists and inventors. He comes to journalism from a science background, having received a PhD in psychology from the University of California at Santa Cruz, where he worked on human sleep physiology. Joe, welcome aboard. Thanks. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Joe and I have never met before nope. this very day, yep. um, and I'm so excited to talk to you. Oh, great. <laughs> um, I, but you, I mean, I stopped being, there's a big question between me and some friends who are scientists but don't practice science of whether you can call yourself a scientist after you've sort of stopped being one that goes into the lab or does research every day. And I've I was, decided, I decided a long time ago that the answer was no, you're not a scientist anymore. But I've, I've been convinced over time that the answer is probably yes, insofar as you think like a scientist. And I think that's probably what it means to be a scientist a little bit. I was just thinking about that. I, I just listened to uh, an interview with a scientist who was talking about how uh, that how science can be used even in business settings and in all kinds of different settings because it's not about the it's not about the science per se. It's about the way that you approach problems and the ways that you look at um, truth <laughs> um, and look at your hypothesis versus your opinion. Um, and I, I think that that's I think that's really accurate. I mean, I would imagine that having that science background and that sense of um, exploration would make you would make journalism a really thrilling place to be. Um, yeah, I I think uh, <laughs> well, the reason I hesitate is I, I sometimes think that uh, journalism and science. Uh, well, first of all, they operate at very different speeds because people are very unhappy when scientists don't come up with an answer in you know, an afternoon or a week, or why is it taking so long to make a vaccine or that sort of thing. And I'm thinking this is lightning speed for scientists, you know? Um, yeah. So at one, on the one hand, you know, they, they operate at different speeds. The other thing is that as a, someone who came out of science, when I look at a scientific paper, for example, and I read the, methods and results. My first thought isn't, I wonder if they're telling the truth here. I mean, I wonder if they really did use five milliliters of sodium hexosulfate or did they use something else and they're just, you know, lying because I have no way of knowing it. That's just whatever they put down on the piece of paper. I, I assume that's right. And from a scientist standpoint, nobody, nobody reads a paper and, and asks that question. They say, okay, you, you put it at 50 degrees, you put it at 50 degrees. I mean, it's, it's not like it's open to question, but there's a saying I was, I was telling my son, who's actually a journalism major, um, 
there's a saying in journalism that if your mother tells you that she loves you, check it out. And so mm -hmm. you're not supposed to believe anything in journalism. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to find it out for yourself. And that's impossible in science. I mean, and 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 especially I, I heard you talking about how, how much scientists you science you have to know to explain it to somebody else. And as hard as it is for somebody who doesn't know a lot about science, it gets even harder for somebody who does because you realize how much detail you're leaving out. Yes. And how much really important caveats you're leaving out. And this is where I get into discussions with scientists who have a hard time talking to the public because they have a really hard time getting it through their heads. That they're not talking to their peers. They're talking to people like you who are interested, maybe, or maybe they're not even interested. I mean, that's the other thing. I always feel that is actually that was one of my big questions for you. I was thinking about that. I think that one of the one of the questions I had was, um, is how do you draw readers in who aren't necessarily interested? How do you bring people to science who are either nervous about it because they didn't do well in science in high school or they are or they or they actually don't trust it? Well, don't trust it. I think I'm going to. Uh, punt on because I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> okay, fair. Uh, I I I'm I'm really troubled by that to be honest because it, again it never occurred to me that there was an issue of trust. Right. I mean, I I know that there have been instances where trust has been betrayed in biomedical research. Not not unaware of that, but you know, traveling down the Grand Canyon when this guy is described, this geologist is describing the ages of the rocks going down the side of the canyon wall. And I'm going, I wonder if I can believe what he's saying to me. That That's just not what comes into my head. Um, but the answer to your first question about how do I engage people is, well, the way I think about it is I put on the big red nose and the floppy shoes and they walk on stage and I have a little honking thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, make a spectacle of myself in a small way and keep people's attention. And the other thing I'm always trying to do is say, I'm, I'm as dumbfounded, gobsmacked, confused as you are, but uh, together we're going to go along and try and figure this out. And, and that's, that's sort of the attitude I bring. The other thing that I bring, I think about this a lot is, my attitude toward every story I do, at least to some degree, is you are about to hear from me the most interesting thing you're going to hear all day today. Now, you didn't know to ask for this because you didn't know anything about it until I told it to you. But when I'm done, you will agree with me that this is the most interesting thing you've heard today, and you can't wait to go tell somebody about it. And I think if you bring that attitude to what you're talking about, um, it helps a lot, but I well, was because you probably are telling them the most interesting thing that they've heard all day, whether or not they they know that. I mean, that's what's that is actually one of the things that's so thrilling about science is that there really is extraordinary discovery. Right. Um, I was I was going to ask you about what kinds of science stories. I mean, obviously, pop culture occasionally dips its toe into science um, in theater and sometimes in film. And I'm curious, are there kind are there stories that um, that you think really lend themselves to that to to that medium to fictionalizing to some degree um, or I guess theatricalizing or are there stories that you can't believe haven't been touched on? <laughs> Or kinds of stories, even. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I mean, the the one thing I encourage you never to try to do is explain optical interferometry uh, on stage Noted. or in any we'll, other capacity. We'll and uh, if you can explain quantum physics to somebody in the course of an afternoon and in the theater, I, my hat's off to you, because after you said the cat's inside the box and it's either dead or alive, that's you know, you're done. <laughs> I've run out. I've said that a million times. I hate it. I literally um, have a play that plays with quantum physics. <laughs> really? There you go. Yeah. I mean, if, if you can explain it and I can understand it, then you're, that's great. Um, I think, y you know, I think the answer is probably not going to surprise you. I don't think the topics really make a difference. I think people make a difference. 
And I think yeah. um, I think the people of science, and and you heard this project about what motivates them. Well, in a sense, they're all motivated by this curiosity that they want to know more about the physical world. But the way that manifests itself, and the questions they ask, and the the ways they deal with um, obstacles and overcome them or fail to overcome them. Those are, you know, those are human stories and, and people like stories about people. And yeah. so uh, I think any science topic. So for example, my favorite example in this is, have you ever heard of Lee symmetry since we're talking mathematics here, L-I? No. Well, neither have I, I'm ready neither to had I. <laughs> um, but here's the story. So Lee symmetry is some multi-dimensional symmetry. I mean, you know, hands are symmetrical, right? But they're not the same. And 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 so this takes it into a level of mathematical abstraction that's completely beyond me. And um, I once was at a dinner party where this guy was saying, you're NPR, you have to do a story. We've proven that Lee symmetry exists at the 16th order or something like that. I said, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, I'll explain. I said, I'll tell you what. If you can explain it to this group of people sitting at the table and everyone at the table had a PhD and one of the people at the table went on to win the Nobel Prize. So these were smart people. If you can explain it to these guys, I'll do a story about it at the end of the day. And so this guy went into a long explanation of what Lee symmetry was. And at the end, I looked at everybody at the table and I said, did you understand that? No, nobody <laughs> understood it. So fine, I don't see how I'm gonna explain it to anybody if none right. of these really smart people can understand it. But then he told me the story about the collaboration that took place to make this proof that was like this giant success story. And in the course of working on the proof, one of the scientists, one of the mathematicians developed ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, right? And so by the end, he was completely immobilized, could only blink. And they he was in France. They flew over and they projected the proofs on the ceiling so that mm. he could look and see the final pages of the paper and make corrections by blinking a certain number of times. And I said to this guy, that's the story. I, I don't know what yeah. the, the, I don't know what the mathematics is. I'll do my best to try and explain it. But now that you've given me a story, I'll hang the science on that um, as it, best I can. It reminds me a little bit of music, actually, the way that um, people do, can't, people don't understand music. People don't understand how it's made. They don't know where, what, uh, like the, the general audience, they ask questions about how do you make music? How can you, how do you come up with music? It's so ephemeral. It's not as concrete as science, but it has, it shares something um, really mysterious. And it's kind of interesting to think about, like I, I, it made me think of um, the Amadeus story, the play Amadeus and the, mm -hmm. the, that, that story and getting through that, that rivalry and getting to this person, the end of this person's life, it all of a sudden creates this, this world where you feel like you understood how this person made music, even though it's kind of um, an optical illusion, you don't quite, or an illusion of some sort that you don't quite understand how it ma was made, but you feel like you understand the person so well that you yeah. understand their thought process. And so therefore you can understand their genius. Yeah, no, I think that's, a, I think that's, and, and the other thing is that if you tell a story about people, they really can understand it in a way that they really can't understand quantum physics because right. I have a friend, uh, in, uh, George Johnson, a great science writer for the New York Times, and, and he used to say that we were creating the illusion of knowledge because you walk away feeling, oh, I, that's so interesting. I really get that. And then you try to explain it to somebody and you realize you really don't understand it that well. <laughs> but in the course of hearing it, you did understand it. It made you feel good. You were you were right there. Um, and that's sort of the difference between what we do, what what I do as a journalist in terms of explaining stuff and what an educator does in terms of teaching something. And I, so I love that. I think that's so accurate and interesting. Um, it makes me think of another another question, which is that um in in theater and pop culture, we have a tendency to create like pretty squishy narratives about these scientific facts. And like, and to what degree does the does the facts matter versus that inspiration and that 
sense of emotionally like being connected to the science in terms of our relationship with science no i uh, i th uh, here's a little secret we 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 take facts out of stories all the time we laugh yeah. about it you know we're trying to give a story with as few facts as possible because we're <laughs> trying to give somebody the big picture you know um especially in an ephemeral media like radio where you can't go back and say now well, remember what i told you 30 seconds ago gone you know forget it so you right. have to um you have to keep the facts to a bare minimum if you want to keep people coming along like, with not you. Let, don't let the facts get in the way of the truth. <laughs> well, no, no, I wouldn't <laughs> go that far. Don't let the facts get in the way of the story. I wouldn't say yeah. get in the way of the truth. Yeah. Um, it sounds like we're supposed to wrap up. This has been thrilling. Uh -huh. I've really enjoyed talking to you about this. Um, sure. And thanks for being here well, and talking to me about science. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Now to join Joe will be Jose Francisco Salgado, who is an Emmy-nominated astronomer, experimental photographer, visual artist, and public speaker. He creates multimedia works that communicate science in engaging ways. As the executive director and co-founder of KV265, a nonprofit science and arts education organization, he collaborates with orchestras, composers, and musicians to present films that provoke curiosity and a sense of wonder about the earth and the universe. Hi, Joe. Hi, Jose. Um, first, I want to say uh, we don't know each other either. Right. But I've enjoyed your pictures very much, and it, it particularly pleased me to see your pictures from Chile because uh, I've I haven't been anywhere that Chile was the last place I went to before the traveling stopped. And so I was in Atacama and uh, okay. a year ago I was at uh, Sotololo and I've seen these things. But one of the things that struck me about your beautiful photographs of observatories is they have a dynamic quality. There's things are moving in a way mm -hmm. that they're sort of static when you look at them as you know, just there's a telescope, boom, doesn't do anything. So when you're shooting uh, uh, an image of an observatory, are you trying to capture the dynamic nature of what the observatory is all about? That's that's one of the things, and I'll go I'll go back to that. But I think that the the main thing that I try to focus is the night sky in the context of the landscape. And it mm -hmm. could be a nat natural landscape or it could be an observatory with man-made structures. Uh, there are some that concentrate on, you know, they just focus on the sky itself and take mm -hmm. uh, photographs of objects that are really, really small in the sky, right, with telescopes. What I love and enjoy the most is the wide field photography where I'm trying to capture, basically take the person there, right? This is how it looks to be standing there. Now, the neat thing about what you're, um, you know, you refer to uh, the, uh, the capturing that motion is I have usually several cameras taking time-lapse photography, right? Because uh -huh. I, make, I make films, but that would be a little bit, you know, boring if I just let the machines do the time lapse, you know, photography work. Which, of course, it 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 also requires some, uh, you know, artistic uh, quality in the in the sense in the sense of the composition and what the sky is going to do and so on. Because, of course, when it comes with a night sky, it's very predictable. We mm -hmm. know when the Milky Way is gonna. Uh, rise and so on. But so what I usually do is I set, I set a couple of cameras and then I keep one camera for myself where I can be more creative and move around and take single shots. Mm -hmm. But then I go back to those time-lapse sequences and then I can decide, I can choose photographs that capture the dynamism of, for, the, for example, the telescope slewing. I love leaving cameras inside the observatory because then the pla the whole platform is moving, the telescope is changing altitude. Is so you have the uh, superposition of the sky rotating, but the machine moving as well, doing the tracking or going to another object. 
So this is we we've, we've sort of danced around this question, but when you're doing this, are you thinking about your audience or are you thinking about your own uh, creation? I think that's a, that's an excellent question, and I was thinking just about that subject today uh, when thinking about you know the questions that I, I'll I'll. I'll I'll ask later on. And I think that this is from my perspective, I, I make art for myself, uh, not for anyone else. Now, if everybody else can uh, enjoy it, and then of course, then you learn about what people like, and then you can use that to your advantage and engage them. But I would say that the genesis of art creating is to satisfy your own needs, right? It's something that I must do. And then I can actually do practical things with it and communicate science. But it starts with what I would, with my a way of uh, expressing myself. Yeah, it's, it's, I ask because people often say to me, how do you decide what to cover? And mm -hmm. sometimes I don't have a choice. I mean, it's, it's in the news, you know, vaccines for, COVID, okay, I get it. That's that's a large part of what I've been doing for the last year. But after that, it's things that intrigue me, that I think would intrigue somebody else. So the so that sounds like it's similar in your case. Yes, and and I'm very very lucky that my academic background is is in astronomy. So when I start making these science and symphony films, I started covering uh, astronomical subjects. But I'm very, very fortunate that astronomy is such a visual science and the images and visuals, either straight images from telescopes or scientific visualizations, they can be so rich and so engaging that then, again, I use them to my advantage to get people's attention and then communicate some science right so i actually I, I have a series of photographs where it's basically it's like science on on a photo meaning there's one single photograph let's say the northern lights but then you have the outskirts of the milky way you have the andromeda galaxy you have a couple of globular clusters you have northern lights with different colors so i can talk about different atomic transitions producing those different colors and with one single photograph, I can get people's attention and then talk for 15 minutes with just one picture, right? And say like, okay, now let me tell you about what you see here. So that's interesting. So you 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 think of the photographs as a an illustration that allows you to tell a story about or tell facts about science. Exactly. And 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 the reason, one of the ways I started doing this professionally was teaching astronomy at night from 6 to 10 p.m. to full-time working adults who would then learn about astronomy for four hours once every every week. And, you know, they're tired and you could be showing them, you know, plots and diagrams to convey something. But then I started showing my photography because let's say I visited Mauna Kea and I have these beautiful photographs with uh, star trails and lasers pointing at the sky, right? Monitoring uh, what the, the turbulence in the atmosphere and then making corrections in the mirrors to get sharper images. And they had so much content, but they were very, very engaging. So when I would tell people, my students, these are photographs that I took, you know, last week when I was in Hawaii, I would get, get people's attention. Why? Not only because not only it's visually engaging, but then you remove degrees of separation. And now it's like, oh, you were there? Oh, you took that photograph? Now tell me about it. And then when working at the Adler Planetarium and showing to the public my photography of the South Pole, because I went there to film and photograph the South Pole telescope, it would be the same story. It's not only the science content, but it's the storytelling as you know, a scientist visiting a scientific site and capturing natural phenomena. So now it's become it becomes more anecdotal, and people are drawn to that. Yeah, I've just I'm, I'm speaking of Adler Planetarium. I think I was there a few years ago when they they did a show based on the search for Planet Nine. This is Mike Brown's uh, well, 
he's one of the people that's been looking. Uh, I guess there's guys here at Washington at the Carnegie Institution who are doing it as well. But that's you know when they dis if they discover when they discover Planet Nine, you know the one that's that's mm -hmm. supposed to be yes. out there that's very massive, but it's going to look like nothing. It's it's going to be a smudge on a on a plate. H how would you illustrate that in a way that would grab people's attention? It's a fantastically interesting uh, discovery. If there's another planet in the solar system, oh my goodness! But well, okay. So since since my preferred medium nowadays is the science and symphony films that get presented while the symphony is playing, right? And what I do is I edit the films to follow what's happening in the music. Oh, so okay. otherwise, so because otherwise the film would get a distraction and people go yep. to the hall and the music is going in one direction and, the, and you're just showing pretty pictures, you know, they're not going to reinforce each other, right? Mm -hmm. So because I'm not making documentaries, but I'm, I, I'm making these art pieces that are based on science, I make sure that the subjects I cover are very vis visually rich so there's a lot of nasa footage historical documents of you know scientific observa observations uh scientific visualizations and then my own photography or whatever it is that i can photograph on earth that it's very visually appealing and just to give you an example so you started with the night sky we have the northern lights we have the most extreme lunar tides right if you go to the bay of fundy you can mm -hmm. see within six hours that the 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 level of the of the bay dropping up to 50 feet in six hours. So it's something that you can perceive. And then of course you accelerate that with time-lapse photography, and then you're gonna get people's attention. So in yeah. my in my in my case, I make sure that what I'm showing it's visual it's very visually appealing so I can get people's attention. Yeah. So so I mean do you have a uh, an intended effect? I mean, you want people to be interested. Do you want them to take away an understanding of science, an understanding of the process, an appreciation of the natural world? I mean, do you? What's a successful piece uh, for from your perspective? So, I, if I can, you know, achieve one thing is to plant that seed of curiosity. Maybe they came to the hall, and they maybe they had heard about the Northern Lights, but then for 10, 15 minutes, they're looking at incredible uh, footage of the Northern Lights. And I, what I want them is when they leave the hall, I want them inspired to learn more about what they've seen on screen. Now, having said that, oftentimes the, uh, the uh, concerts are preceded by a pre-concert lecture. So that way, you know, I have uh, an attentive audience right there in the hall. And that's why, I mean, this is why that what's great about KV265. We're bringing science into non-conventional uh, 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 fora when it comes to science communication, because people go to the concert hall to listen to beautiful music, not to learn about the universe. But sometimes it's actually part of the program, part, sometimes it's, it's part of our pre-concert lecture, but at the very least I come on stage and give an introduction to the film and put the film in context yeah so so do you have something i mean just we have we, I, I think i have time for one more quick question <laughs> yes what what's on your plate what are you working on now well let's go back to you know your initial uh, question which was uh, very interesting that you mentioned the night sky um right now i'm uh, wrapping up production uh for nocturnes uh based on uh, uh debussy's orchestral suite and what i'm doing is two things uh is i'm covering the night and the night sky as inspiration not only to artists painters and musicians but also to scientists right because the night sky is like a portal into the universe and then i'm contrasting night in the city shot in in paris and you know that's a light show in itself, but mm -hmm. it's it's a man-made show. And contrasting that with the third movement, which is entirely shot in places like you mentioned, like you know Chile, Puerto Rico, and other other dark locations, Yellow Knife, Northwest Territories of Canada. So, Night and the Night Sky is the 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 the, the newest work. Can't wait. Sounds great. Well, Jose, thanks very much. This is very entertaining. Uh, Aaron, thank you. Thank you, Joe. 
And now to complete our circle of conversations, we're gonna bring back Lauren to speak with Jose. And after that, we're gonna have a Q and A period. So please offer your questions through the chat on YouTube. Hi. Hi, Lauren. Nice so meeting you. Pleasure. Oh my yes. God. And it's funny because I'm thinking, okay, let me see which things can I ask. And one of those things I'm, I'm these are all, all, all. Now I know why Aaron said that this was a very uh, uh, fruitful and, and successful uh, format. And now I see why, because he's asking me questions that I was thinking about this afternoon uh, when it comes to that need to create art. Yeah. And then at the same time, I thought of something and you kind of started with that at the beginning of the program. So the question is, your academic background is in creative writing and fine arts. Did you develop an interest in science before or after developing an interest in the thespian arts? Yeah, I was always an arts person, always a writer, um, mm -hmm. very close to, to words and language and performance. Um, but my mom was a physician's assistant um, who worked in Atlanta for decades in a car for, for a cardiologist. So she had this, um, uh, love and passion for biology and medicine. And I didn't realize at the time, because <laughs> frankly, I'm a fainter and here she is holding hearts with her hand and I can't cut myself with, you know, you know, just a little kitchen knife and I just pass out. So I was, I knew I was not destined for, for that sort of, um, field. But from her, I learned um, a deep appreciation for the kind of practical, practical science. And then, um, I in, 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 in high school was just smitten with the stories of science. And I think what, what struck me um, were the people. And this is something that, that Joe made me think of um, when he so beautifully you know, said that oftentimes the, the, the real heart of science is not a theory, it's not an idea, it's the people doing it. It is the, the, the risk and reward that they're after and the truth and the, mm -hmm. the journeying that they have to do. And that to me as a little baby playwright, I just said, that's drama, that's, that is drama. And the, the eureka moment, um, the idea of putting that on stage when Newton, you know, whether there was an actual apple that fell or not, mm -hmm. What, what did that look like? What did it feel like in his body to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, I have an idea, <gasps> you know? And to me, there's nothing more dramatic than that. So I started to just be drawn to these stories of science, um, partly because they're fascinating and my curiosity takes over, partly because I hadn't heard them told before. And when I realized, oh my God, Emily du Chatelet was this incredible um, physicist before there was the word physicist and she was a lover of Voltaire's mm -hmm. and she translated Newton in France and nobody knows about her. I need, I need, there needs to be plays about her, you know, mm -hmm. um, so over and over my career has, has been that the combination of feeling like science is very stage worthy. Um, exactly. but also just, I, I want to know all the, all the, the hidden stories. So obviously you concentrate more than in, than in science itself, but in, in the process of science making yeah. and in the stories of the people responsible for 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 these discoveries. Right. It, and and I, I think it's fascinating because oftentimes in textbooks, we're told all the facts and we are right on all the formulas and all the theories and who was responsible for what. But it doesn't go further than that. So yeah. basically, you're telling the, the you're telling the story of how these people were motivated and in the process of achieving what they did. Because it's the how. The how is fast. That's what the I want to do. Exactly. What on earth was this combination of this particular personality, the history, the baggage, the curiosity, the passion, the rejections in the past, the um, the drive to prove oneself, the time that they're in. Um, and I was certainly drawn to the stories of, of women in science, which have a particular um, extra drama because it was so damn hard because they were not invited and not welcome in that space and certainly extends to people with different uh, abilities and um, people of color, uh, um, you know, the kind of global majority still being locked out of a um, of a primarily white and male scientific establishment. So those stories take on even more because it's not just about the science, it's now about personal politics and it's about uh, international um, uh, trends and and about uh, culture and activism and all sorts of things. Um, so I, 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 think, I think play is kind of like what you were just saying about how you have one picture and you can talk about so many things. Mm -hmm. 
um, if it's the right, if it's the right image and inspire such depth of conversation, well, to me, the play, a play is the same thing where we can, yes, talk about facts and scientific theory. We can talk about how this particular, the historical fact, um, as opposed to the scientific fact. And then we can talk about how has the world changed at all? Is it how it's still hard for women in science? It's still hard for people who aren't traditionally represented in these spaces. And so in one play, you get to talk about a lot. <laughs> so have you encountered a subject, uh, let's say, you know, a person whose story is fascinating, but it would be very difficult to convey what the science is about? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> um, Emmy Nother, uh, a colleague of Einstein's, um, is someone that I have read as much as I can about her and listened to as many podcasts as I can about her and have explored. And her life is fascinating and and heartbreaking in a way that doesn't quite make sense for a nice, well-written play. But the fact that Einstein called her the smartest person wow. <laughs> in, in theoretical <laughs> physics, that's saying something. Um, I cannot for the life of me figure out what the heck her 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 science is about. Um, dimensionality and corners of you know, theoretical mathematical mm -hmm. models. And I, so I'm, I'm desperate to write about her in some way and I have no idea. <laughs> Okay, so then that's the challenge that you're thinking yeah. about because again, it would be so 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 hard to not only for you to comprehend that yourself, but also to convey that. Because I guess that at the end of the play, you want people to say, "Oh, this is a fascinating story," but how is this science, you know, relevant? You know, relevant or 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 wh why should I care about you know about the science? Yeah. So I and guess you know, it's a, as, as Kate smart. said, you want people to feel smart. You want people to say like, oh, that's mm -hmm. the relationship between magnitude and distance of stars and, and light. And oh, I, I get it. That's really neat. Or even if they get most of it, but they have to mm -hmm. go like, I'm going to Google that when I get home. But I think I got it. Great. Um, so I and, and, and kind of what what Joe said as well in a play, we don't, we, it doesn't really serve to stop and have a big lecture and pull out some diagrams and things, but right. so we want to make it an organic part of the storytelling, have the, the ideas and the length, the scientific language feel very natural in the character's mouths, um, as opposed to kind of this interloper into a, an otherwise <laughs> organic story. So that's the balance of like how much right is there how much fact can the story hold b before it gets overwhelming for audience and and performer right and, and maybe you know the, the all as long as people understand that that led to something really important to the right be it yeah. you know medical or engineering then not they don't necessarily have to know the details of in between but they know that hey this is a good story and of course it led to this and society has benefited by us having that you know, right. discovery or yeah. invention. In some ways you wanna, you wanna in, in storytelling at least, and kind of like how you were talking about the music needs to match the power of the mm -hmm. image or the, the film, um, and they kind of need to be in sync with each other. Yeah, you, you need to be able to be in sync with the the steps of discovery. And this led to this, it's the dominoes, like what what what's the mm -hmm. next domino? hit and that I think can lead the audience to to not being told oh they've made a big discovery but to the, to have it happen and even in pure silence the audience can go oh they, mm -hmm. they got it that's when we do we do our job really well as storytellers is when we don't have to say um that was really important what just happened but they know the audience okay. know um, okay yeah. and then in the uh, catastrophes so that is based on the life and work of your husband's work as a as a virologist. Did COVID nineteen serve as an impetus to create you know to creating uh, this work, or was it the seed planted way before twenty twenty? Oh man, that's such a great question because it's kind of both. I mean, I'd never mm -hmm. ever thought that I would write about him um, because for some reason it felt like you weren't supposed to as a writer write about your family so directly. Um, and, and so I kind of had always known my husband is, is, is very smart and very fascinating and interesting person. That's kind of why I married him. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But um, when when COVID happened and every, all of our worlds changed and our relationship to the word pandemic and the relationship to the word virus changed, um, you know, it, it really did uh, uh, kind of switch the, 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 the editor in me that said you shouldn't right. write about that to going like, I don't know, let's see what happens if we do. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, it, it all happened during during lockdown. And um, the team that put it together at Marin and Roundhouse was just extraordinary because we're doing this thing. Like I was breaking my own rules by even writing the thing. We were breaking our rules by writing a play, but it's it's filmed, so it's a film, but it's oh, a play. Yes. We're breaking the rules of film by having an actor look directly in a camera, which every screen actor knows you're not really supposed to do. So we were just, yeah. all the rules were being shattered as we were creating this. Okay, and uh, again, going back to, you know, Joe's uh, uh, a question about creating art, I assume that you write because again, you feel that you need to, but obviously all of these works have a uh, very important science communication component. So how important it is to, you know, for you uh, to communicate science or is it, or is it a balance between the storytelling or, or do you see yourself as a science communicator through uh, th theatrical works? I do. I do see myself mm -hmm. as a science communicator, less about um, the, uh, uh, the theories and hypotheses in play. And I'm not the person you want to turn to, to have a mathematical conversation about whether something is, pr uh, is true or not. But I, I think it's, it's for me, explaining the adventure and the passion and the thrill and how riveting science can be. Not always, of course, there's, a, as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of lab time where mm -hmm. nothing is happening. Why are we doing this? Right. This is never gonna work. Um, and then there are those moments that are captured uh, you know that 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 those are the moments that I try to put center stage are the eureka moments the 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 sense of like this is what I've been working for, and that is emotional and it's human and it's exciting and it is um, you know to to quote my my husband he he talked about you know just peering peering for a second into the into the universe, he, hearing very clearly the universe. And it doesn't, it, you know, the, the the airwave isn't open for long and you don't get full confirmation. But if if you're doing science right, it's almost like the universe is like, good job, here you go. <laughs> Here's some truth for you. Um, and how amazing that must feel like. Uh, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know that exact thing, but I'm fascinated by, by that. And, um, so we're doing something very similar because they go to the theater, they hear stories, they hear about some scientific concepts and you hope that they leave the theater and they learn more about that on their own, right? And in a similar way, I'm showing uh, these incredible images from NASA, original photography, historical documents, marrying them to music, telling them as much as I can within the medium and when I talk to them, but I, the end, what we wish in the end is the same thing, right? That they leave the concert hall in my case and they learn more about what has been presented. Yeah, they want to know. They've now right. been bitten by by the by the bug, so to speak. And and uh very, and very, your researcher follow your own interest. Yeah. Very well. So what's next for you? Oh my gosh, there's all <laughs> <to play. laughs> <Some. laughs> Yes, right. I'm sure you're the same. We just I uh you know for, for writers during this time, um, you know, so, some of us have you know, we're used to being in an office um, <laughs> typing away at home. So for me, the pandemic hasn't been uh, as much of a change from my normal pace. And so I've, I've been able to keep keep going and keep conversations going and 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 collaborations, some of which with Bree and Kate being being some. And but yes, also, I think learning um, trying to step back and really appreciate every single moment with family and friends and those conversations that I so dearly miss the time in rehearsal at, at a theater watching plays um you know that's I'm I'm grateful and excited to to come back to just the simplest things of being in a busy theater lobby <laughs> milling about is is something I I really long for so okay great um I'm not sure if we I I, I think we'll we're gonna get a cue, right? I think I think we are moving into our our okay. QA now. But so so then how great okay. it is to talk to you. Your work is so fascinating oh. and absolutely breathtakingly beautiful and um, encouraging uh, to to know as much about the universe as possible. Yes, and maybe we'll can find some uh, common ground uh, theater and, uh, and 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 music and and symphonies. I mean, I think this is, we have the right team built on this very right. call to accomplish very something. Good. <laughs> very good, we'll follow up. Indeed. Okay, well, thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you, Aaron. Great, thank you, Jose and Lauren. We're gonna bring back all of the panelists now.
And we have a number of questions that have come in through the chat. And Jasmine, Nikisa, and I will be um, delivering those to our panel. Um, I'll start off with one uh, from Jeffrey Marlowe. How do you balance here's something amazing with let's go on this journey of discovery together? The former is punchy, but maybe patronizing. And the latter feels more genuine, but maybe a little slow. I mean, I think the truth is the journey is the point of the story, uh, certainly for, for musicals or plays and tracking um, kind of as Jose and I were talking about those dominoes. What is the, the way that the story um, unfolds? Uh, so I, I, I think that the journey and the how and the, the what happened next and then what happened next and then what did that cause and then what happened next, like that's the whole name of the game for, for dramatic structure behind storytelling. Anyone else on striking that balance in your work? I mean, I think you never want to be in a position of telling someone when you can show them, at least in, and, and I think that that actually goes across the board with everything we're talking about. Um, and I think it's why Jose ended up finding the, the way that he makes his art too. Like it, 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 from what I've gathered, um, we're trying to create an experience so that then you feel immersed in something and you feel like you're inside of it rather than making rather than distancing you and putting you in a position of watching it from afar and therefore like I'm telling you what it was. Mm -hmm. um, there's this really silly, this is very this is a little bit of a non sequitur, but there's this very silly opening of a second act in um in the musical of Carousel where they sing to you about uh, how they had a clam bake while you were at intermission. You were at intermission, they had a clam bake, and then they sing you this whole song about the clam bake that happened. We it's had a real nice clam bake. It's the weirdest thing that ever happened, because you're sitting there and you're like, well, I didn't get to go to the clam bake. Why are we at the clam bake now? Like why, the whole point of being in the theater, the whole point of telling these stories is to make them alive for you. And if, if it happened 10 minutes ago, I don't care. Um, so that sense of being there in the moment and what it would feel like to be there in the moment, I think is the thing that you're, at least I'm always trying to grab for. Great, and another comment I wanted to pull up, um, again, a question for anyone, but especially our theatrical folks. Uh, a playwright colleague once told me that science has been replaced uh, has replaced God as a central subject in drama. What do you think of that hypothesis? <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> I love it. Let's do it. I mean, I think that there is something to um, the exploration of 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 the mysterious and of the uh, divine. And what is the divine? I think is a really wonderful question, and I I I find it to be in the space between fact and exploration. And I think that 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 speaks to my soul and music speaks to my soul. And those things feel both ephemeral and real at the same time. And so I, I that is that does feel like maybe a, not a replacement of God per se, but um, uh, that exploration of the ephemeral and the what is what is eternal, I think is a really interesting question. When I think about like my relationship with like scientists in the world using CRISPR technologies, right? And like where I am and what I'm doing and what they're doing and the ways that may impact coming generations. Yeah, I can like use religious language to describe my relationship with those humans. And like, and it, it feels as far out of reach as playwrights centuries ago wrestling with deities might have felt. <laughs> um, I'm going back to the set of questions at the beginning of our session together, and I'm going to combine a few of them for you guys. Um, going back to pop science, if you can elaborate a little bit about what you think, what you mean by pop science, is it the same as citizen science? And related to that, what techniques do you use to make the audience feel smart? 
I, well, I'm the word. I'm the person who said pop science. So I, I will say that um, <laughs> I, I'm thinking of people, of real scientists who are trying to talk to lay people like me, um, who are, they're, they're, they're dumbing down the math. They're um, making it a little easier for me to take it in. They're they're telling me a story. <laughs> um, it's all the things that you know. If I there's certain subjects that I can go deep on, and I can I can read the like really um, drier information because I want the information so bad. But I need I need the person who's going to tell me the good story about the science, um, mm. and, and that. And that's why I enjoy reading science articles and science, and then also science, some science books, but they are, they do tend to be a little bit, I think they would be relatively boring for someone who really, really understood science to read. And that's, I think what I mean when I say pop science, which might be citizen science. I don't know what citizen science is. I don't is. know. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it could be. <laughs> if it's okay, I mean, I was just gonna say, dumbing down is a, is a phrase that makes me crazy because I don't think of dumbing down science. Uh, I think of simplifying it. Dumbing down, it seems to me, makes people feel like, oh, I could never understand this. And and if I and if I did, I must be, you know, it's science for dummies. And I and I get that. That all worked. But um I I tell scientists, you know, who say, oh, I don't want you to dumb down my work. I said, look, if I could explain what you've done in 35 years of research in three and a half minutes, you really haven't done very much. So give me a break. I mean, I'm talking about your work in a way that people can understand. I'm not trying to dumb it down. I'm trying to simplify it. Anyway, that that just that's one of my uh, it's like fingernails on a blackboard for me. And Sounds you're like trying to pull them in, right? Like you're trying right. to get people so that they don't feel they don't immediately turn off. And right, I think that's right. the part that makes people feel, you want to make people feel smart. You want to make people feel like yes. it's okay to be in this conversation with me. Yes. I'm like, we're, we're on the same, we're, we're going to speak the same language. I'm going to speak yes. your language and I'm going to bring you in and then you can start to feel smart and then you can ask me a question and not feel dumb about it, but feel like you're learning something. Yes. Yes. That's exactly and it. I, I will say, you know, in, in some of my work, one of the, um, it, I've had the opposite where scientists come and are grateful for the chance to have something that can be the lightning rod to focus um, other people's questions and to mm -hmm. up and clarify themselves. Like the play only went this far, but in the talk back or in the conversations after in the in the other partnerships with academic institutions, you can have so many other conversations. And and one particular example was was for a play of mine called Silent Sky about um, <clears throat> the early astronomer Henrietta Swan Leavitt and her colleagues, and Annie Jump Cannon at uh, the at the Harvard Observatory. There was a group of female um, physicists that came to see the play, um, and they during the first scene we see all these women come on stage, and they said afterwards, almost all of them that they had, it felt like they were seeing their sisters. Like the, So the idea of just seeing these women who were footnotes to most people, but to them heroes, they were the, first, they, they were the original people doing what I do now. And so in some ways it's not about the science at all. It's as Joe said, it's about the people. It's about the people with the passion. Um, and that perhaps is what theater can do more of, um, or at its best, that's what it does is say, any one of you could follow that passion um, and be on that stage. And, and to, but to have these female scientists <laughs> in the audience going, oh my gosh, they're right there. They're really there. Ah! Um, you know, <laughs> Maybe not, not be every audience member had that like fangirl attack, but, <laughs> but these NASA, NASA physicists did. <laughs> There's something really powerful about seeing something on stage that seeing, seeing yourself, um, seeing some version of yourself doing something and imagining you, especially as a young person, like imagining yourself in a setting. I, uh, Lauren, you had mentioned the other day that um, the first time that you were in a new play, it was written by Tina Howe, and that that it was written by a female playwright is such an enormous, has such an enormous impact. It like blew my mind to to read that, that, that that was your first play that you were, the first new play that you were in, like by a living playwright. And I think that that's so interesting, like that, that 
we're looking to create that sense of possibility mm. in all of these settings. Um, and that's what makes that's what makes people feel smart is because not because they did something smart, not because they know something, but because they feel like it's possible to know something. Mm. Great. Um, I'm mindful that we were going to wrap up at 930 Eastern. I just wanted to point out in the chat that there was a pitch um, for a Kate, Bree, and Lauren collaboration on Rosalind Franklin. Um, <laughs> so I think there's a lot of material there. So maybe we can see that in the coming period. And I want to give Lauren and Jasmine and Nikisa a chance to talk about how our audience can watch The Catastrophist, which was the motivator for um, our two events in the series. Jasmine, <laughs> do you want? Sure, yes. Uh, so The Catastrophist, which Lauren spoke about today, uh, is a play that is streaming on demand now through July 25th, right? Is that the extension? It did so well that we extended it through the entire summer. Isn't that exciting? Um, so it's a play that explores the life and work uh, of Dr. Nathan Wolf, uh, the virologist who really first sounded the alarm for the potential need for pandemic insurance, which of course now we are living through, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, but it's it's a beautiful story. Uh, you can buy your tickets still either at Marin Theater Company's website or Roundhouse Theater's uh, website. Uh, beautiful story. Please support it. You can watch it now through the summer. <laughs> there, there it is. Yep. And also, I know we're uh, running out of time, but I want to commission all of you to do a project all together. <laughs> We're, we're going to in, involve journalism and astronomy, photography, and musical, and a play, and we're going to do the whole thing. The whole thing. Because now is not the time for anything. So Go we're going to make it happen. <laughs> Maybe, uh, Jose, we can turn some of your photos into backdrops. I love it. On our stage. Uh, uh, because yes. your photos are Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about something similar. Yes. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much. much. Great. Well, thank you all for your insights about this fascinating intersection between science and storytelling. And thank you for our audience for tuning in to this very special discussion. As we mentioned in the chat, uh, this was recorded and it should be available pretty much immediately on YouTube with the same link. So please share it with your networks, uh, friends and family. We hope a wider audience can have access to this virtual event. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>